On this worksheet, we're going to practice classifying molecules as aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic. Um, so part of this, I'm going to go through the different criteria for being aromatic, anti-aromatic, and non-aromatic. First of all, aromatic and anti-aromatic compounds have to be a ring. Non-aromatic compounds could either be a ring or it could be a straight chain. All of these molecules are rings, so we're not going to be able to use the ring situation as a way of classifying anything as aromatic or anti-aromatic. Second criteria um, for being either aromatic or anti-aromatic is that you have to have what we refer to as a continuous system of p orbitals. So it's like kind of a um, kind of an intense phrase, a continuous system of p orbitals. This again, this is a characteristic of both aromatic and anti-aromatic compounds. Non-aromatic compounds do not have this continuous system of p orbitals. So um, first of all, continuous system just simply means every atom in the ring. Every atom in the ring. It's okay. Um, if this continuous system does not extend outside of the ring, it just has to be every atom in the ring. So that's the continuous part. And the p orbital part means that every single atom has to be either sp2 hybrid, um, which means that it would be part of a double bond. Could be a carbon-carbon double bond, could be a double bond with another type of atom, like a carbon-nitrogen double bond. Uh, every atom could have a positive formal charge, or it could have one or more lone pairs. We'll put pairs in plural. So again, it doesn't mean that every atom has to have all four of these criteria, just any one of them. Every atom in the ring has to either be part of a double bond or have a positive formal charge or have a lone pair or be sp2 hybrid, um, anything like that. So uh, as we look at these molecules right here, really what we want to do is focus on the atoms that are part of the ring. And we're looking to see if every one of those atoms meets one of these four criteria. So for example, this first molecule we're looking at, this atom, this atom, this atom, and this atom, they are all part of a double bond, which means that they are all meeting the structural criteria for being either aromatic or anti-aromatic. I'm just going to erase them because we don't need to look at them anymore. This atom right here, which has four bonds to it, four bonds on an atom, that means that it is sp3 hybrid. Um, in addition, that atom is, does not have a double bond, it doesn't have a positive formal charge, doesn't have any lone pairs. So this atom right here is an sp3 hybrid. And because of that, this molecule is non-aromatic. Because the molecule does not meet the characteristics, the, the requirements of being either aromatic or anti-aromatic, it has to be a non-aromatic molecule. Let's take a look at our next example. So for this one, when we look at the atoms in the ring, these atoms here are all part of double bonds. This atom right here has a positive formal charge. So this means that this molecule here is either aromatic or it is anti-aromatic. We'll come back to distinguishing aromatic from anti-aromatic once we've gone through all of these molecules. Um, this one, this next one, when we look at the atoms in the ring, we can see that these ones are part of double bonds. That's always the easiest thing to find. And this one has a positive formal charge. But this guy right here, this guy right here has four bonds. It's got those two bonds to hydrogen plus these two bonds right here. So that makes this atom an sp3 hybrid. And because it's sp3 hybrid, that means that this molecule is non-aromatic. Here's our next example. Here are the atoms in the ring. These atoms are part of double bonds. The oxygen atom, even though it's not showing, the oxygen atom has a lone pair of electrons. So the oxygen atom has a lone pair. All of the carbon atoms are part of double bonds. That means that this molecule is meeting the structural requirements of being either aromatic or anti-aromatic. Again, we're gonna come back and distinguish them from each other. 
for this molecule down here. Um, these atoms are part of double bonds, so are these carbon atoms. The nitrogen atoms are also part of double bonds. So this is also either aromatic or anti-aromatic. This one right here, double bond, double bond, double bond, double bond, double bond, double bond. Every atom is part of a double bond, so it is either anti or uh, aromatic. And our last molecule, we've got double bond, double bond, double bond, double bond. We have a nitrogen atom with one, two, three, four bonds. So that means that this nitrogen atom with four bonds is sp3 hybrid, and it is non-aromatic. All right, so we've got a lot of them figured out. We just need to learn how to distinguish the aromatics from the anti-aromatics. And this is a little bit trickier. This requires kind of a funny math equation. Um, to, dis to distinguish aromatics from anti-aromatics, the first thing that we have to do is actually count the number of pi electrons. The pi electrons are the electrons that are part of the carbon-carbon double bonds and sometimes lone pairs of electrons on the molecule. Let's just start by counting pi electrons that are part of the double bond, starting with this molecule right here. When we're counting the pi electrons, we're counting the number of electrons that are in the double bond in the pi part of the double bond. So we know that in this double bond, there are a total of four electrons, but only two of them are part of the pi bond. Two of them are part of the sigma bond. So this molecule here has one, that's not a great color, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, six pi electrons. We're going to make a note of that. Um, the next one that we weren't sure about was this one right here. Now this one's got a lone pair on it, so we'll do that one later. This one, this molecule right here, we can count its pi electrons, two, four, six, uh, actually, I think I'm going to save that one because I want to explain that one a little bit more. Keep skipping them. We'll go to this one. Count the pi electrons on this one. Two, four, six. This molecule has six pi electrons. Uh, okay, so like I said, sometimes when we are counting pi electrons, sometimes we count lone pairs as well. Now, how are we going to know when to count a lone pair and when to not count a lone pair? When we know that our molecule is either aromatic or anti-aromatic, every atom in the ring is contributing to this continuous system of p orbitals with one of these criteria right here. So what you're going to do for every atom is you're going to ask yourself, how is this atom contributing to the continuous system of p orbitals? This atom is contributing because it's part of a double bond, and that means that we count its double bond. This atom is also contributing for the same reason and with the same bond. We're not going to count the bond twice. These two atoms are also contributing with their double bond. Again, we count the double bond only one time, no matter how many atoms are part of it. This atom right here is contributing to the continuous system because it has a lone pair on it. And that means that we have to count that lone pair as part of the pi electrons. So this molecule has two, four, five, six pi electrons right there, six pi electrons. Now let's go down to this last one right here. This last one's a little tricky. Um, again, we already know that we're going to count this double bond. Every atom is contributing. How is the atom contributing? These two are contributing with their double bond. Um, this atom here and this atom here are also contributing because they're part of a double bond. Um, so that means we want to count this double bond. We want to count this double bond as well because, again, this double bond is how this atom contributes and this double bond is how this atom contributes. Now, what about the nitrogens? The nitrogens are part of a double bond and they're also with a lone pair. So what do we do about that? Well, each atom only gets to contribute one time in one way. So this nitrogen atom, because it is part of the double bond, and the double bond has to be contributing because that's how this carbon atom is part of the continuous system. Because this nitrogen atom is included in the double bond, that means we cannot count its lone pair of electrons. Again, because every atom only contributes in one way. And this nitrogen atom is being forced to contribute with its double bond. 
Same with this guy down here. So we cannot count the electrons on those nitrogens because they, the nitrogens are already being counted with their double bonds. So this guy also has six pi electrons. And once you count out how many pi electrons you have, you're gonna fit that number of pi electrons into one of two different math equations. Equation number one is 4n plus 2 equals the number of pi electrons. Equation number 2 is 4n equals the number of pi electrons. And in these two equations, n has to be an integer, 0 or 1 or 2 or 3, etc. Maybe those actually aren't integers. I don't know the math term. n has to be a, a one of these types of numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. It can't be 0.1 or 0.5 or negative five or anything like that. So what we're going to do is take this number, I mean they're all six, every one of them, and we're going to try to fit that number into these equations. So we're going to say 4n plus 2 equals 6. Let's solve for n. This equation is true when n equals 1. Um, for this second equation down here, if we try to fit it in, 4n equals 6. Again, what I'm doing is plugging in the number of pi electrons into this equation, and then I'm trying to solve for n. Uh, in this equation, n would be 6 fourths, would be 3 halves, which is no good. But this one is good right here. Now this number n, or this term n, does throw students for a loop. They're trying to figure out what does n have to do with any of these molecules. n has nothing to do with any of the molecules at all. n is just a random variable, no relationship to the structure of the molecule, nothing like that. What you're, all you're trying to do here is plug in the number of pi electrons and then see what you get for n. If n uh, is one of these numbers, which it is in this case right here, that's going to tell you if the molecule is aromatic or anti-aromatic. If the molecule is aromatic, then this first equation for n plus 2 equals pi electrons, that's going to result in n being a whole number, an integer or whatever it's called. If um, 4n equals the pi electrons, then the molecule is anti-aromatic. And you're never going to come into a situation where the number of pi electrons is going to work in both of these equations. It's going to work in one or the other. Whenever you have six pi electrons, the aromatic equation is true. And that means that this molecule is aromatic, this molecule is aromatic, this molecule is aromatic, and so is this one. No anti-aromatic molecules on here at all.